Well, I think perhaps we should begin. My name is Steve Young. I'm the Global Executive Director of the Co Roundtable. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. And my personal thanks to our recipients for all they have done. And may I add to that my hope and expectation about all that they will do in the future, because that's sort of what this award is about, the past, the present, and the future. The Co Roundtable uh, has roots, deep roots in Minnesota, but it's named for a place in Switzerland. That's sort of why it's sort of odd. Co, C-A-U-X is a little sort of hamlet halfway up the mountainside down from Geneva, where there's a big meeting house. And some business leaders gathered there in 1986 from Japan, United States, and Europe, and dealt with the question, um, which we're having today, really, with respect to the People's Republic of China, which is how do you handle the intersection of political power, government, and free markets. In those days, uh, it was the Japanese, whom to the astonishment, I think, of American and European business people, were producing consumer electronics and automobiles of better quality and lower price than what we were doing. And the response by some people in business was tariffs. Keep people out of your market if they're going to take away your customers even though their product might be better for your customers. The, the group then in 1994, a little while later, uh, came up with a set of ethical principles for government, from which we decided the other year that you should recognize people who do work in business. And also last year we recognized people in law enforcement who lead from a, sen from a sense of a moral core and who care about the stakeholders they have. So a few introductory comments, if I may. What are we trying to achieve? A better world in a small former courtroom here in Landmark Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. How? You try to achieve a balance of moral purpose and practical accomplishment. As I said, the, the group first came together in 1986. 1984, at the initiative of some Minnesotans, uh, they came up with ethical principles, written ethical principles, seeking that balance. The Japanese contributed a concept of kyose, Japanese concept which literally means symbiosis. And their instinct, particularly Mr. Kaku, who was running Canon at that point, is that a company is in symbiotic relationships. A company without customers is bankrupt. A company with, what should I say, disloyal, malingering, not particularly qualified employees is in a lot of trouble. A company which cannot raise capital, either from equity investors or from creditors, is pretty soon out of business. Secondly, there was the standard of human dignity contributed particularly by Jean-Luc Ders, a very devout Catholic, based on the 1991 encyclical of uh, Pope John Paul II, human dignity, a respect for people. And third, I would argue, there was this concept of stewardship, which came from the Minnesotans. And it was driven by the example of Minnesota companies, and especially the Dayton family businesses. The Minnesotans who were there included Chuck Denny, who was CEO of, of ADC, Tony Anderson of H.P. Fuller, uh, Elmer's son, Chuck Dietz of, of 3M, and they had been energized by Bob McGregor, Robert McGregor, whom some of you may remember. Bob had worked for the Dayton family for many years. He'd set up the, the, uh, the Dayton Foundation, um, and then he ran for the city council of Minneapolis uh, to make sure that he, and Bob, by the way, had trained as a Presbyterian minister. So um, he is very exacting in his expectations of people. Bob wanted to be here today uh, to congratulate our recipients this year and to sort of put this in a historical context. But uh, two days ago, it, he lives outside of Chicago now. It was rainy and slippery, and he fell. Bob is over 90. And caught his, tried to catch himself with his hand, <coughs> broke his wrist. So um, he can't be here, and he sends his congratulations and his apologies. 
Now, to um, set a little bit of a context, but with a certain, hopefully, proper degree of humility, I want to sort of tell you where I was last month and where I was last week. Um, so last month, I was in Najaf, Iraq, and then in Rome at the Vatican. Just the normal day for CRT people, right? Uh, in Najaf, we have, we have had a project looking at some aspects of Islam, which are interesting. But we were in Najaf to meet with Shia, the Shia Muslim intellectuals. Um, and in the tradition of their founder, Ali, who was the um, son-in-law of the prophet, um, they're using a phrase on their own called peaceful coexistence, coming out of their Muslim tradition. Now, we, in our work with, with sort of values, had stumbled across a number of years ago the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, in his lifetime, gave covenants as an agent of God to respect and protect Christians. In his covenants, he says that these obligations of respect for Christians are binding on all his followers until the end of time. Now, these covenants have been overlooked for 1,300 years. So we put together, with help from um, several people, including Cardinal Tomasi at the Vatican, a little study group trying to rec re recall the, the, the historical reality of these covenants and to lay a foundation for their being recovered by both Muslims and Christians. And that, that led to our trip to Najaf. It also led to uh, our subsequent meeting after Najaf with Pope Francis. So last month, I'm in Najaf with Shia intellectuals, and then I go to Rome, and then we have a meeting with the Pope, and we're talking about reframing Christian-Muslim relationships, right? Not bad for somebody from St. Paul. <laughs> then, last week, um, I was in Bangkok, I just got back, where we had a sort of a parallel track um, looking at, at some Buddhist ethics. Now, I, I have some experience personally in Southeast Asia. I, taught co corporate social responsibility at a business school in Bangkok on and off before COVID, where I met a, a venerable Anil Sakya, who was originally from Nepal, now he's in Thailand, a very senior monk in the, in the Sangha order of, of uh, the, the Buddhist church there. But of interest is he's a descendant of the Buddha. And he is thinking about how to reframe a lot of the Buddha's teachings in his lifetime in more contemporary terms without references to idols or Mahayana this or Bodhisattva that. And so we were there to, to try to see if we can't with the co roundtable um, pull together some harmonies between Islam, Christianity, uh, and Buddhism. And, um, and then on Wednesday afternoon, our meeting was supposed to be on Thursday morning, which I had hoped would be a planning meeting. It turned out, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that um, the, the king, uh, decided that, that he likes this initiative, because it's also partly in respect of his father, King Rama IX, um, who came up with thinking called sufficiency economy, which is very much like, like a moral capitalism, or what, what you guys do. Um, and so the, the, the king sent a personal representative, and everything became highly a full protocol, and this and that. So I didn't get a lot of planning done, but we got sort of the, the, uh, the blessing from on high, in Thailand at least, from the king, that thinking in a fundamental way about good ethics, good morals, responsible engagement in business and in government is something that we as human persons really need to do. Today we present the Dayton Award to three people, which is very much a part of the global aspirations that I've just been speaking about which are important to this very small network, the Co Roundtable. If I may say, these are times in our country unlike any I have known. There is division, there is distress. Leadership is wanting. What can we do? We can recognize those who lead with courage from good values of stewardship. As was once said on the eve of our revolution, let us raise the standard 
to which the wise and the honest may repair. The rest is up to God. At this point, David, I'd like you to present the Dayton Awards to Mary and Chris Kowalski. The um, special haiku is here, and the awards are over here, and this a product of Kowalski's is right here. All right, I'll do my best, Steve. I'm David Kansas. I'm a member of the Co Board. It's good to see some for, former colleagues here. I'm just going to tell a brief story. I, when I was um, just out of high school, I grew up in St. Paul. I was just out of high school, and um, I was working at Finger Hut as a telemarketer, and uh, I wanted to take one day off to meet a girl. And they said, no day off, and so I quit my job. And then I walked up Grand Avenue to the Red Owl, Kowalski's Red Owl, 1985, and I um, said, hey, you hire anybody. Um, do you have any jobs open? And I filled out the application. They hired me to become a bagger at Kowalski's. Um, and it was, it was one of the best jobs I ever had. Uh, it's still memorable to this day. I became a, we worked together, <laughs> I've never told you guys. So we, uh, uh, I, I was a bagger, and then I worked in the stock room, and I was in college at McAllister, and we did the stock room, and it was one of the busiest grocery stores in the country. I mean, we, the load would come in at 8 o'clock, and we would just work until the load was done, sometimes 2 in the morning. I remember one time when we first got Jolt Cola in there, I, you know, the guys would drink all the Jolt Cola before it got on the shelf. Um, but that was, I, I, and then I became a dairy manager, and then eventually I transferred college to go to, to New York. And I remember meeting Jim. He was at the time at the Lexington store. And he had his office there, and I, I felt it was important for me to, you know, I was 19 years old. I was like, I should go tell him that I'm leaving because I love this job so much. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm moving to New York. And he looks at me and he goes, you don't need to go to college. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, I, yeah, well, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to college. And he, and he said, you'll be back. And 22 years later, he was right. I did come back. <laughs> but I didn't go back to work at Kowalski's. I lived two blocks away from the original Kowalski's on Grand Avenue. And I probably am there at least once a day, if not more frequently. So this weekend, after Steve asked me to do this, I went looking through my various things, and I found my name badge from when I worked at Kowalski's. And it's kind of a, it's a little ripped off here, but what's kind of funny about it is <clears throat> there was a manager, Paul Domrose, I believe it was yeah. Dan is that Paul's, yeah. and he always made fun of me because I kept taking time off, and so he called me Vacation. <laughs> so my name tag said Vacation. So I treasure this. I treasure the experience, and you know, the reason that this Dayton Award is, is personally important to me is I felt the culture there was fantastic. It, um, it stressed hard work, it stressed uh, getting the job done right, it stressed the customers, um, and that continues today. And I think it is a real treasure um, that I live just two blocks away, and I can go in and see all those things I experienced as a, as a young adult man uh, that helped form me and how I worked, still living through the organization that is there today. And I can't think of any better reason to have a Dayton Award than to have something that has had this enduring impact on our communities. And I'm, I just, you know, Mary and Chris, I'm just, you were only Chris Kowalski when I worked with you. <laughs> Chris Christian. But, I, but I, I, I just want to thank you guys. I mean, it was a wonderful experience. And um, Dan is, is here also. And before there were computers, he was the guy who managed the entire inventory of the no, store. The yeah, I know. But he, he has probably a little more tools than he did. He would just kind of wander down the aisles be like, yeah, we need seven of those, 100 of those, 50 of those. <laughs> and it was, it was, he's a savant. So anyway, all those things continue to influence me to this day. And I am, I will always be grateful. And so congratulations. I, um, I, do I give them the bag as well as? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? 
Give the bag to the audience? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, for, um, for all the work that you've done as, um, oh, here's the, um, for all the work you've done as um, civic leaders and for the communities that you've served, we award you the state and award and the co-round table thanks you for your enduring commitment to making this a better place for all of us who live here. So thank you. We always, we always give a, a haiku. Okay. So, okay. so this so is the a haiku. The haiku is sun rises and sets, fruit ripens, but not too fast. Warm hearts and cooking fires, goodness for all. Presented at Kowalski's Market, May 2nd, the co round table for World Capitals. Wow. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hold it. <laughs> wow, uh, to have such a personal testimony to go with this award probably makes it as meaningful as can be, as, even though it already is. So I thank you for that. Um, I appreciated Dave's comments about how he felt at 19 years old in 1984. I can just say to you that if we hadn't gotten involved in civic organizing, it wouldn't have lasted because how do you pass on a culture? We didn't have anything written down. We had no um, f foundation, no, no um, um, core foundation of how to pass a business on to the next generation, who are these people, and Chris, of course. And one is Michael Wesson, he is my nephew, and he is C, I hate labels, I hate titles, so I'm sorry about this. Mike is C, O, O. <laughs> um, and uh, Russ is our civic leader in the company. He teaches inside and outside civic organizing. He's done an incredible job. He's been with us tw 22 years. Um, Dan, of course, Dave talked about Dan as being part of the team back in 1984. Dan started when he was 16. He is now ch chief. Chief. She's chief. VP of operations. VP of operations. Still a savant, by the way. Yeah, he's still a savant. Yeah, he's got the numbers. But anyway, I just I thank you so so much. But um, seriously, if we hadn't gotten into civic organizing, and Michael Hartunian is in the room somewhere. Oh, there he is. Um, I sat on a, at a table with him with uh, Peg Michaels, who's the author of um, the Minnesota Active Citizenship Initiative, and it was just an idea an ideal at the time. And um, as we kept talking about what was wrong and what, and I was the business leader that, they, that Peg Michaels knew that brought me to the table to begin with, with Michael at the University of Minnesota. And because I had, both Jim and I, and then I myself, um, looked at every kind of, um, you know, how to work with difficult people, bring that in, you know, uh, good to great, all the books, all the management books, all the business books. And they were all had their peace, but none of them were lasting. So how do you build something sustainable that will be here without me, without them, without Chris, if we should ever be that long, hopefully. So um, from that came a uh, a, a document about civic business would take on the role of putting this into practicality. Could this work? Could these theories work? Could these standards work? Could these? And um, they did. They worked for us. We lost a few executives because that was not their way to manage, was not through belief in human capacity and all of the standards that we have. So, um, and Michael was a core leader in that for me at the very beginning, and I thank Michael for that, because now we're into it at least 16, 17 years, probably, and it's within our whole organization, and the first question we ask when we hire somebody is, what is democracy to you? They're 16 years old, the 16-year-olds do really well, they're in school, they've read it, they've memorized it, but they've 
but they, they take it on, they understand it completely. So to simple terms, I would just say that we are, um, it has solved a lot of, it's better business in a lot of ways, but our obligation and responsibility as a company in our communities where we all have to survive together, whether every business, every church, every bank, every whatever, um, to educate people about words. And I think there was just a document by you about words. Yes. yes. And I read it carefully about words matter. We think truth matters. We have those ads out. We believe that that's true. It started with the George Floyd about you know that. And so to me, it was, yes, we need to do something about all of this. And we need to tell the truth about food and what it means and, and, the, and uh, what that means to us. So I won't take too much more time, but I surely appreciate this. If anybody's at any interest in civic organizing, um, you can see, you can Russell leave his name with you or whatever to get in all the information you may need. But uh, this is an honor, a true honor. So I thank you very much. A couple seconds to echo everything she said. Obviously, as the next generation, um, you do look to how, how am I going to possibly carry this culture on? And when we brought in civic organizing, that was the answer because it becomes more than me. It is not about the leader. It is not about charismatic leadership, uh, familial relationship leadership. It is about a higher meaning. And so that's when we took on civic business. So if you do read the side of our bag, it is about our civic commitment. And the crux of what we're teaching people is just to be an active citizen, just to take your role seriously in a democracy. You have a built-in power. We teach them how to acknowledge that power and then how to use it responsibly toward the common good. So thank you. Thanks for your words. First of all, I want to add my congratulations to Mary and Chris and, and the whole Kowalski organization. Your uh, excellence in leadership has created a place where uh, it's a pleasure to, to shop. And, uh, and I thank you for our Thanksgiving dinner last fall. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which was delightful, and your people could not have been more helpful. So, so thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to uh, congratulate uh, the Co Roundtable. Uh, Steve talked about its history going back to 1986. Actually, it goes back to 1938 when an organization called Moral Rearmament was uh, started uh, to bring a, 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 a moral dimension to the situation in the world in 1938, which was just at the beginning of the Second World War. And uh, as I understand it, the, uh, this organization, Moral Rearmament, played a uh, primary role in the reconciliation of Europe after the Second World War. Uh, so they have a long history of 85 years in the moral, um, in the area of moral living. Um, <clears throat> Real also has a uh, long history, not nearly as long, uh, it was founded in 1970, so it's uh, in the 53rd year, completed 50 sec 52 years. Uh, and uh, Steve mentioned that uh, uh, the, these two organizations have been on kind of parallel paths for a long, long time. And occasionally those paths have crossed. Uh, most notably in 1994, when the, Steve mentioned the uh, conference in Co, where the principles for business were 
introduced and established. And uh, Riel was, we were uh, pleased to be part of that, or that conference. And, uh, uh, and Riel also has documented their principles in uh, two, uh, two documents, one called the uh, a, uh, a Declaration of Belief and the other a Direction, direction Statement. And this, these two documents align very well with the Cole Roundtable's Principles for Business, although they're written in very different styles and uh, uh, different level of detail. Uh, one of these, to give you an example of, uh, of principle or moral uh, uh, leadership that Kyle has provided to, uh, to, to uh, Rael, one of the co-principles cool reads, listen to and where possible act on employee suggestions, ideas, requests, and complaints. Uh, in our, in our document, the uh, declaration or the, or the uh, direction statement, one of four principles is to treat others the way you were, would like to be treated. And by the way, that, uh, that principle shows up in almost every world religion, often in very, same, very similar words to the Christian statement of, uh, treat others as you would, would like to be treated. Uh, <clears throat> one example of Kyle acting on this principle involved the future of the Real subsidi subsidiary in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, at that time, uh, it had come, the well, it had been. Uh, uh, the, the, the labor costs in the Netherlands were so much higher than those in the rest of the world, even the United States, that manufacturing had become almost in, un, in, in what's the word? <laughs> Untenable uh, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and the board, the rail board, had uh, come to the conclusion that there was very little to be done other than, uh, than terminate the, uh, that subsidiary or to shut it down. Kyle thought about these principles and the first thing he did was go to the Netherlands and he was totally open with the people at the Netherlands, not only the leadership, but all of the coworkers there and explain to them the dilemma and the inevitable outcome if, it couldn't, if this couldn't be resolved. And in, invited them into a conversation. He also told them that, uh, that, he, that they had, that Rael had contracted with a uh, um, survey company to survey the, the Customers of the Netherlands to determine whether there was a whether they found value in Rael's presence in the Netherlands, and they did find that that that, uh, that there was value uh, in terms of the intimacy of and the quick response, particularly in uh, uh, new development of new applications. Uh, he was concerned at that time about what the response of the coworkers would be to that information, whether they would respond negatively by jumping ship or, or behaving in other negative ways. But that isn't what happened. In fact, the opposite happened. They responded very positively to his openness and uh, even began to work on their, their initiative on some uh, uh, efficiency projects that wouldn't hopefully narrow the gap 
in between the costs at, in the Netherlands. Well, to make a long story short, the shutdown was avoided, and uh, that was about five years ago, and uh, they've been uh, operating uh, successfully for the last five, six years since that time. So, now, whereas, <laughs> whereas the Coal Roundtable has established the Dayton Award to annually recognize exemplary practitioners of moral capitalism, and whereas Kyle has led rail in an exemplary manner through good times and hard times, for the last 14 of its 52 years, and whereas rail has thrived both culturally and economically as a result of Kyle's principled guidance, and whereas rail has become a practical example of the vitality of moral capitalism, and whereas Kyle has consistently lived these principles in both his professional and his personal life. Now, therefore, it is my pleasure and privilege to represent the Cole Roundtable in presenting Kyle with the Dayton Award for 1922. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And Kyle, can we also give you uh, your haiku? <laughs> thank you, Bob. Hi, Kyle. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your remarks, and I uh, appreciate it. Um, it's always humbling because there's always you know, many people behind the scenes. Uh, it's never an individual, and uh, that's true. I know the Kowalskis would feel that way, and, and congratulations, Mary and Chris, uh, but it does take a team, and uh, pl pleasure to have uh, some of my team members here, all of them actually, and a couple of board of directors, and it takes all of that to, to be able to, uh, to do what you need to do in a business, uh, even a small business. Um, but I do appreciate very much the, uh, but well, before I forget, we really need a Kowalski's. The Northeast is building out. Lindstrom, we really need that, Mary. So just consider it. I, you know, it's small, but we're vital. So, um, but it is an honor to, to be able to uh, receive this award. And um, it's been a great opportunity for me to be involved with the leadership uh, in one facet or another in Real for the last 17 years. And um, also, you know, to Steve's earlier comments, the future looking ahead even when I'm not directly involved, is, uh, is something that I'm also very excited about because we have just such a strong team and uh, a great base to work off of. I'm appreciative of Bob and his other two founders of the company to have the foresight to put down some foundational documents that don't tell you what to do, but it gives you some guidance. And I think that helps with the continuity and sustainability of the company. Um, you know, at Rail, we always say that we don't only measure our business by the economic results. That's obviously important you know, because without that, you can't survive. But there's much more to it than just having economic success. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, how you impact people. And I loved hearing the story of, you know, here's the name tag. You know, that was just awesome. Um, and that's the kind of connection that you want to have, right? There's an engagement there that you can't get in other ways. And uh, so as we look at, you know, how we impact people around the world, whether it's here in North America or in Europe or Southeastern Asia, you know, kind of the common connection between our coworkers and our communities and our customers and our suppliers and our communities, um, the common thread across all of those are people. And uh, it's one of the reasons that from the very beginning, uh, Real has always given back a significant portion of their uh, profits to help communities and things like our international project where we've built a school in the Dominican Republic over the last nine years. Those things are deeply, um, I think it's very satisfying in addition to the business results. And you only get to do those if you have good business results. But it brings about some really engagement and fulfillment that kind of is a 
uh, meta purpose over the top of for what we do, which is build and design world-class motion control products, which is cool in itself, but. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, the common thread in all of these are people, and you know, I think you know, people are created in the image of God, and I think just because of that, they deserve respect and dignity, and uh, that's how we try to go about doing it. Any of those constituencies, that's how we deeply um, desire and aspire to treat people, and I think the seven principles of the co-round table fit in nicely with that, um, and we're proud to continue to try to look at how do you make the world a better place through business. And I think business, when done well, can really impact the world in ways that many other um, institutions can't because we can go anywhere in the world and we've got a mechanism that we can reach out to people and provide meaningful jobs, uh, help the communities. And uh, I think it's often, you know, business just gets a bad rap and because there are things that happen and uh, in the business world that is not noteworthy, but I also think that there's a lot of companies that are striving to do good things. And uh, I'm very appreciative of the co-round table recognizing those businesses uh, each year with this award. And hopefully we can continue to create momentum there. So I'd like to express my gratitude to the co-round table for what they do, uh, for my colleagues sitting out here, uh, board of directors, and for our founders. And uh, we'll continue to do our very best to try to impact the world through business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have um, two sort of comments from previous recipients of a Dayton Award. As I said earlier, Bob McGregor very much wanted to be here uh, to share to share sort of his thinking and the origin of the Co Roundtable principles and um, the Minnesota tradition, the Minnesota heritage. And not being born in Minnesota, but having lived here for a number of years, I think I can say that the Minnesota heritage is what it is. It is good, it is strong, it is real, and it resonates with people around the world who also have the similar kinds of values, regardless of their culture or their religion, as we've heard from Mary and Chris and from Kyle. Um, Andrew Ciceri, who was recipient before CEO of U.S. Bank, sent these, these words. Good morning, everyone. And I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person. As a former co-roundtable honoree, I want to extend my congratulations to Kyle Smith, Mary Ann Kowalski, and Chris Kowalski Christensen. Acting with integrity, serving as a humble servant leader, and focusing on doing business the right way creates loyalty, commitment, and growth. These attributes represent the legacy of the Co Roundtable, and it is an honor to be celebrated for demonstrating its virtues. Thank you for this opportunity to extend my well wishes and congratulations on this terrific accomplishment. Uh, we've also asked uh, Don Samuels, uh, who is here with us, uh, for, some, for some remarks and thoughts. When I first met Don years ago in St. Paul, he did, however, move to Minneapolis, but we, we, have, we have to live with these kinds of things. Don, uh, Don was an inventor. Um, and I was always very impressed with that, Don. As you know, Don uh, and his wife, Sandra, they both received the award for, for their efforts uh, in, in North Minneapolis uh, on many levels in, in dealing with what we are now focusing more and more on, what should we say, differences of outcomes, life circumstances, how people shape themselves in order to make the best of who they are and where they are. So, and then Don um, also ran for Congress last year. And I was very happy to see him do that because he is a man of integrity, of courage, and great wisdom. Don Samuels. Good morning. It's so great to be here and uh, to see my friend Steve continuing to do the great work of thought leadership and, uh, and bringing people together uh, across faiths and across uh, the boundaries of nations. And uh, it, it's so uh, uh, honoring also to see the, the honorees this year as you've talked about your faith, you've talked about um, the transcendence of family to embrace a larger cause and a larger uh, interests. And also for Kyle and 
the philosophy that uh, guides you of a similar kind. And uh, it, it, when, when I was a kid in my dad's church, we sang, um, my dad was a pastor, uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red or yellow, black or white. And, and, and that was a, an, a, a first attempt for, a, for um, uh, the, this family of uh, 10 kids, <laughs> the Samuelses. Um, to begin to embrace a larger world. We come into the world as individuals in a fetal position, <laughs> wrapped up in ourselves, and, and gradually we become part of the family, and then we start singing songs like that. And in the United States, of course, um, you pledge allegiance to the United States uh, and to the flag, and, and, uh, and then you, you talk about one nation, indivisible, uh, uh, with liberty and justice for all. And, and so the kids are repeating these things, singing these things, and beginning to um, kind of um, unknowingly begin to uh, embrace a larger understanding, a larger meaning of what their team is. And, um, you know, the big threat to us today is this AI thing you've been hearing about, artificial intelligence, and they're saying that it's going to be and will be and probably is already smarter than any one individual and that it will have access to all the information of all, in all the books, in all the world, anything you can Google, AI will have it, and then it will have your personal information with all your personal preferences and your family background and all of that. And so AI is going to be able to um, uh, customize for each individual persuasive arguments, persuasive, persuasive um, constructions that you will not be able to resist. And, and so the manipulation of the population of individuals or groups is going to be a huge threat in the future. Now when you consider where we are in, in our divisive times, you can see how um, that could be used when people don't see uh, people across the aisle or uh, or, or across the fence as being one with them, then you're the other and it was, it's, you can more easily manipulate. And so uh, as we face that future, uh, there's the, the scientists are saying Congress needs to put the brakes on AI and put some laws into place uh, and also some serious consequences for violators in place so that we can we can't afford to have a situation now where we have a technology and finally government catches up and makes laws that by the time you catch up, the damage will be so grave that humanity itself will be at risk. And so we have to pause, uh, bring great minds together, create laws, move cautiously into the future. And as we think about that awesome this in incredible intelligence floating around, potentially in the hands of evil individuals, and how dangerous that could be for our world, um, it seems like the future looks pretty glum. But as, as we are here today and we see two communities, two families, that are uh, 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 charting a different course for humanity, not just for uh, a family, not just for a company, but embracing a larger understanding of reality of human beings and the common interests. And which is, of course, uh, just right in line with the core round table, which is transcending religious boundaries and transcending national boundaries for a common understanding of our humanity. We can't fight the evil of AI individually and because then we will use it against our enemies. We have to fight it collectively, not just as Lutherans or Catholics, not just as Minnesotans or Texans, not just as Americans or Japanese, not just as Christians or Buddhists, but we're going to have to do this as a human community. And the, the world will be looking for little sparks of that in companies, in organizations, in nations, in leaders that can have 
a path forward, can shine a path forward for how we can transcend our individual egos, individual interests, and even our national interests for a united interest for common humanity. And so I am so inspired by what's happening here today in this room in the three, uh, three, 364? 326. 326. <laughs> Room 326 in, in the Landmark Center, something special is happening that will provide hope for a future that otherwise will be impossibly daunting. Thank you for charting the way. Thank you for including me. Let's move together and uh, provide some hope for the future. Thank you. I would like to leave the last words with Don Samuels. Thank you all very much for coming. Congratulations again. Uh, thank you for accepting the award, and uh, welcome to the team. Thank you. <laughs>